Ambassador Mondale uh, set the tone for our conversation to the day. And as always, Fred uh, has a very clear idea about how we should go forward. So uh, we'll be subjecting that and other interest to forensic examination, I hope, during the course of this panel and the next panel. Uh, Ambassador uh, Nakamura, who's this year's chair of the APEC SOM and Japan's ambassador for APEC, will present first on the panel. He has a PowerPoint, and so uh, Ambassador Nakamura will call you forward. But just let me say before uh, Ambassador Nakamura presents, this is a, an extraordinarily important period uh, in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, it's extraordinarily important, as uh, Vice President Mondale said, uh, because of the increased salience of the region to global affairs. Uh, and APEC and the relationship of APEC uh, to success in navigating this period uh, is going to be very important. And as Ambassador Mondale said, uh, Japan and the United States have a peculiar responsibility in uh, steering uh, APEC through this period. Uh, APEC uh, has a big year this year. It's uh, 2010, uh, the year for delivering on developed country ambitions for the go Bogor Goals. Uh, that's an ongoing process, but there's been a huge achievement thus far. And others will tell you in the course of the discussion, I'm sure, uh, about the details of that achievement. Uh, but how to reshape the vision, uh, as we were encouraged by Ambassador Mondale, uh, is a key interest in carrying the core agenda of APEC forward. Uh, one idea is the TPP idea. Uh, and that's on the table. There's no question that that's an issue uh, that is out there that will exert its influence on carrying the liberalisation agenda forward. But the liberalisation agenda now is obviously uh, only part of a much broader APEC agenda. Uh, if it's to be an agenda, as Ambassador Mondale suggested, that encourages the continuity of inclusiveness in regional cooperation across the Pacific. And that's what we'll talk about, I think, importantly in this first session. Uh, so with those introductory remarks, uh, Ambassador Nakamura, we look forward to your presentation. Good morning. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having this occasion. And everyone is anxious to know what is going to happen at the Tokyo or no, or Japan's 2010 uh, summit meeting. So I'd like to give you the, uh, uh, some, uh, some brief look at the uh, uh, agendas of what we are, we are going to pursue. But uh, in the first place, I'd like to extend my appreciation to Vice President and Ambassador Mondale for his kind words of bilateral relations between Japan and the United States. And such an encouraging and positive assessment of the APEC, it gives us a great sort of confidence to pursue the success both in Yokohama and in Hawaii. Thank you. So with the uh, limited timeline, I would like to give you a very quick glance at the uh, PowerPoints and you can refer back uh, this uh, uh, PowerPoint at the uh, 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 website of the uh, foundation uh, sometime later. So APEC turns 20. APEC has celebrated 20th anniversary last year. And APEC has pursued liberalization and facilitation of trade and investment since 1989. And we have witnessed some achievements Needless to say, concerning the average tariff, number of member economies, inter-APEC trade, and APEC business card easy travel issuance. So all these figures show the last two decades, 
uh, Asia and Pacific region has achieved such a tremendous economic market and uh, enjoy the prosperity. Well, these are the, some uh, diagrams of showing the uh, largest economic group uh, by ABEC as compared to EU or NAFTA. I do not dwell on the uh, figures here, but you can watch such a uh, dis distinguished uh, development of the ABEC of the last uh, two decades. And uh, looking at the exports and imports, clearly these figures also show the development of ABEC as compared to the other institutions. We have already referred to the uh, very important agenda of Bogor Goals. A Bogor Goal uh, has been uh, issued at the uh, uh, Indonesia uh, summit in 1994. It clarifies that further reduction of barriers to trade and investment is necessary without specifying any specific level of reduction. And differentiated timelines are set for industrialized economies 2010 and developing economies 2020. So this is the year we have to assess what we have done the last 16 years. And when we speak of the industrialized economies, we do have uh, some volunteer developing economies to join the 2010 group. So we have now 12 economies to assess their trade achievements. And uh, the last nine economies will do that by 2020. And assessment of achievements, everyone is wondering what kind of assessment be held. We will look at the uh, tariff, non-tariff measures, service, services, investment standards, etc., etc. Uh, usually, all these items are seen in the uh, chapters of the uh, uh, free trade agreements. Of course, looking back the last two decades, we have witnessed new challenges. Uh, the concept of trade liberalization is not the same as we have now. Of course, we have witnessed the increased globalization and greater, fast, greater and faster movement of people, goods, and money. And we have also witnessed the new threats to human security. And uh, we have experienced uh, some of the uh, uh, economic crisis. First, Asian financial crisis in 1997, and two years ago, we have had a global economic crisis. So uh, this year, we have set the uh, theme of the summit as change and action. Of course, we will see the changes, and we'd like to translate the change into practical action to lead the future. And I'd like to introduce some of the uh, Japan's preliminary idea on EPEC new visions. Of course, bearing in mind with what I have said by coping with the uh, changing world, the firstly, we would like to study regional economic integration. Uh, this falls into two categories. One is uh, pathways to free trade area of the Asia Pacific, FTAAP. This concept has been developed last four or five years, and this is dealt with within the framework of APEC. Outside APEC, the TPP has been referred. So we are studying uh, both ways to look at within and out of uh, APEC uh, concerning the uh, uh, developing uh, economic integration in this region. And we will see some of the key areas of REI. Namely, this uh, concerns about the uh, business interests. We would like to see how the business is carried out without having any such costs and time. So we would like to see easier, faster, and uh, shorter sort of uh, business to deal with. Uh, this is the uh, very much uh, uh, assignments we, are, we have been carrying on, and we will do it uh, for the uh, another uh, years to come. And we are now having a new growth strategy with us. Uh, this growth strategy uh, has been already declared at the uh, Singapore summit last year. And this growth strategy falls into four or five uh, categories. One, balanced, and secondly, inclusive, thirdly, 
green growth, or in other words, sustainable, and fourthly, knowledge-based. And uh, newly, we like to introduce a secure growth concept. This concerns about the uh, human security. And uh, thirdly, we like to pursue, again, the agenda of, of, of human security. So I'd like to uh, explain all these items uh, one by one uh, in the following. This is what I have already explained, so I go forward, move to the, uh, the diagrams. Well, I, I was very much impressed by hearing the uh, U.S. interest on the TPP. Uh, TPP has been shown in this diagram, the uh, uh, left, uh, right hand at the bottom, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Four nations are original parties, and four nations are now uh, applying for the uh, uh, admission of this TPP. Uh, it will take some time, I think, uh, the eight, uh, eight nation uh, treaty be he, he concluded. However, we are uh, clearly and uh, clearly interested in uh, seeing the development, development of this uh, TPP e e process. But when you look at the uh, uh, above uh, items, one is uh, uh, you are quite aware of the uh, developments in ASEAN. And we have already had the ASEAN plus three process. Japan, China, and Korea are now uh, joining the ASEAN to aim at the uh, uh, economic trade agreements somehow in the future. And then in parallel with the ASEAN three, it has been developed into ASEAN plus six. ASEAN 10 countries plus six. Uh, six go Australia, New Zealand, and India. So uh, these two uh, regional uh, integration process, two regional uh, economic uh, uh, group uh, has been discussed. And uh, I think uh, it will take another years to come to uh, see more materialized sort of way. And uh, APEC is dealing with the uh, free trade area of the Asia Pacific, so-called FTAAP, FTAP. Uh, among the uh, 21 economies. But uh, uh, bearing in mind with the uh, non-binding nature of the APEC, uh, this cannot be developed into the uh, uh, binding treaty or agreement uh, modalities. However, we like to seek the uh, possible pathways to reach this FTAAP. And the TPP, some, some members insist that the TPP would be a very much a model uh, to represent this uh, possible pathway. Uh, as I have explained, the new growth strategy has been expressed in the Singapore. Uh, they have already expressed uh, in a more broad and general way, we we'll put in place next year, or well, this year, comprehensive long-term growth strategy, and supports more balanced growth within and across economies, achieves greater inclusiveness in our societies, sustains our environment, and which seeks to raise our growth potential through innovation and knowledge-based economy. I do not dwell on the, uh, each elements of this economic growth, but uh, you can see these uh, concepts are not new, but uh, we have a uh, new sort of uh, ideas to deal with this growth uh, strategy. Balanced growth and uh, uh, sustainable growth, this growth has been already discussed in the G20 forum. And the uh, Singapore uh, summit has uh, issued that the inclusive growth has to be taken more seriously as a part of the uh, growth strategy. Uh, and, but uh, when we deal with these economic growth, uh, we would, will not uh, deal with them separately or independently. For instance, uh, knowledge-based growth, in other words, innovation, innovative uh, growth, uh, will, be, uh, will be seen in the uh, green growth in terms of the uh, uh, field of su such energy field uh, like uh, energy conservation or uh, alternative energy. Or, or innovation can be helpful uh, for the uh, uh, small and medium enterprise growth or development. So uh, all this uh, growth will be uh, very much a cross-cutting. And lastly, the third pillar of our agenda, human security. Uh, last year, uh, the summit has declared we reaffirm 
the importance of enhancing human security and reducing the threat of disruptions to business and trade in sustaining economic growth and prosperity in this region. And key areas are counterterrorism measures. Of course, this agenda, uh, this item has been already discussed since the 9-11th. And we are going to put the uh, more emphasis on food security this year, holding a ministerial meeting. And we are going to see how the agriculture uh, issue, such as uh, availability and affordability of this uh, food products, uh, be uh, taken care of. And of course, uh, we, have to, uh, con we have to continue to deal with the emergency preparedness. Well, already this year, we have witnessed the uh, disasters in Haiti, and Chile, and now uh, China yesterday. So we are having a very much a networking to deal with this emergency preparedness. And we have had a working group already in Kobe this year. And uh, this is also a familiar uh, item, countering the spread of infectious, infectious disease. So uh, all of these will be uh, addressed at the uh, summit this year. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, some ideas uh, on the food security, but I pass it. Now, we, when you look at the uh, 21 economies in APEC, of course, we can see the different level of economic developments. And we still need the economic and technical cooperation among the members. We'd like to extend our technical cooperation to the uh, uh, economies uh, which need to upgrade or to be consistent with the, uh, any APEC agendas. So economic and technical cooperation, so-called ECOTEC, is still a very important factor to play a role. And uh, economic and technical cooperation ECOTEC, based on new concept and agenda, has been set to deal with the following uh, agendas. So I would like to conclude by saying the following uh, points. The APEC continues to consolidate the Asia-Pacific communities. The APEC continues to strengthen networks. What, a what makes APEC unique is uh, this is not only for the government, but for the business community as well. So the government, business, and academia, all these stakeholders are getting together to enhance the cooperation within the region. And we are happy to uh, say that uh, the cooperation, the collaboration between the government and business uh, communities have been, have been developing and we are closely contacting each other uh, nearly month by uh, month after month. And we'd like to say that uh, APEC continues to be the locomotive of economic liberalization in the Asia Pacific region. So uh, we would like to really pursue the uh, success of the APEC summit this year, bear in mind with the, all these uh, concepts, and we'd like to ask for your support and cooperation to make us available uh, for that purpose, for that aim. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Ambassador Nakamura. Uh, if you and all the rest of the panelists for this session would now like to come up, and then we'll uh, take uh, Wendy Cutler's presentation next. After Wendy Cutler, Wendy, as you know, uh, is uh, uh, assistant uh, in the USTR and responsible for APEC affairs. Uh, Jeff Schott, uh, here a senior fellow at Peterson. And Paul Tai is first assistant secretary for economic policy and trade uh, in the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, what I plan to do in the time remaining, and we're going to crimp some time with Fred's permission from morning tea so that we can give the panellists a fair shot uh, at addressing the big issue that they've asked, been asked to address, which is the prospects for the core APEC agenda. Uh, give them uh, 10 to 15 minutes each to make their initial presentations, but hopefully we'll have some time for interaction among the panellists and some questions from the floor before we close the panel. Wendy, over to you. Mm. Um, well, um, thank you um, very much for inviting me to be on this panel and to the organizations that are hosting this event. I think this is really timely and really important 
because as we prepare for APEC 2011, um, I think there'll be a lot more enthusiasm and a lot more focus on these issues. So having this type of discussion at this point in the year in 2010 is extremely important. Um, when I heard um, Vice President Mondale speak this morning, um, I look back on my career um, when I used to visit him when he was ambassador to Japan along with Charles Lake and others who were working um, at USTR and he would always say, are you back and what are you working on? <laughs> and I'd go through the issues, autos, insurance, telecommunications, um, and then I thought today, if they, he asked me this morning, are you still working on those issues? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, a couple of them I still am working on. I don't think beef was an issue when you were there, but I <laughs> assured him I was working on that. Um, but we are working on those issues, but in the early 90s, those issues, I think, really characterized our economic relationship with Japan. They were characterized more by trade friction and today, even though we have these bilateral irritants, and they are important, and we need to work with Japan to resolve them, we have a relationship that's more and more characterized by cooperation, because we have a lot of shared interest in the region, globally, bilaterally. And that's where APEC fits in, because I think this is a great vehicle with back-to-back -back host years between Japan and the United States to really um, build on this cooperation and um, at the same time to revitalize and really to give APEC the momentum, to revive the momentum, to use the Vice President's um, words. Um, some of you may not understand why this back-to-back -back idea between two hosts is so important and in some ways novel. And just to give you a little perspective, in the old days in APEC, you'd have a different country hosting each year. And for their host year, they'd come up with their own themes, their own priorities, and um, they would, we would have nice declarations at the end of the year. But one thing we saw, there was very little follow through on what was announced the year before and very little um, building on the successes of the past year. And so that's what we're really trying to do this year. And um, we're very lucky that um, our Japanese colleagues have been working so closely with us in preparation for their year um, now during their year and for us in preparation um, for our year. Um, Ambassador Nakamura has given you a great um, overview of um, Japan's objectives um, for the APEC year. We largely share um, those objectives, but I thought I could just highlight four areas um, in the trade um, and investment world that we are particularly um, focused on and um, really want to work with Japan to have um, meaningful um, outcomes. The first um, is the issue of the Asia-Pacific regional economic integration. And here, let me just make a few um, comments, um, and that is that um, there are many ways to get to a free trade um, area of the Asia-Pacific. And in the U.S. view, probably the TPP offers the most promising path to that. Um, that is being negotiated by a subset of APEC economies outside of APEC. And so the challenge for APEC is what can we do, the 21 member economies of APEC, to move the ball on regional economic integration, recognizing we're not negotiating, um, you know, a, 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 um, the deal. And the conclusion we've come to is the, probably the most important contribution that we can make, and indeed that we are making, is to further work on substantive cutting edge issues that negotiators and other fora are gonna need to deal with. And so we are extremely pleased that the TPP negotiators, even after their first round, have already commented on um, their appreciation for all of the work that APEC has done in areas like supply chains and other areas that are, you know, quote unquote, these 21st century issues. So we are focusing on working with Japan, Australia, and others on furthering the work in substantive areas. Last year, we put a big focus on services. This year, Japan will be trying to move the ball ahead on the investment area. And in, for the United States, 
um, we hope to lead um, some groundbreaking work in the area of standards and um, TBT issue, technical barriers to trade issues. The second issue I want to highlight is in the old days we used to call it trade facilitation. Um, now we're calling it making it cheaper, easier, and faster to trade in the region. We all think it's a little snappier. <laughs> um, and here, um, what we have found is that APEC economies really share a common um, interest in finding ways to make it cheaper, faster, and easier to trade, to get their goods, their services across the border. Um, and um, the business community is also very um, supportive of this agenda. And in fact, it's a part of our agenda where their ideas are factored in um, almost on a daily basis into our work program. This is the area where we're working on supply chains um, and other issues as well. The third area I'd like to highlight is the area of environmental goods and services. Um, this is um, very much in line with the focus on the green growth issues by Japan, by Korea, by others in the region, and by this administration. And so what we are doing is trying to contribute to the work in the WTO by doing um, further work on non-tariff measures um, and um, looking at regulations in this area, incentives in this area, and trying to do more on the education front um, in this area. Um, let me then conclude with the fourth issue, which is the so-called um, review of the BOGOR goals. Um, and we've had some discussion of this. Um, we are now undertaking the review. Um, these goals were agreed to in 1994, 16 years ago. I would just make two comments here. In 1994, only five um, APEC economies um, declared themselves as those that would be eligible to be reviewed in 2010 as industrialized countries. And what we have seen this year is a number of other economies volunteering to be reviewed in 2010. Now, whether at the end of the day they want a footnote somewhere in the document saying they still consider themselves to be a de developing country, put that aside. I think these economies are volunteering um, because they have reached a level of economic growth, prosperity, um, and have achieved so much on the trade front and investment liberalization front that they want to be hand in hand with the 2010 economies. And I think this is an extremely positive development and something that when we conclude our review this year, um, we will, um, I think, will receive a lot of attention. The other thing I would just mention is the trade landscape has, tra has changed dramatically um, since 1994 when the Bogor goals were concluded. Um, at that time, the Uruguay round was just completed. Um, the issue of services and IPR were really, you know, put on the trade agenda in a central way for the first time. And a lot of the issues we're dealing with now on the trade front, whether it be competition policy or transparency or e-commerce or environment, those issues weren't even considered trade issues for the most part um, during, um, at that time. And so in the BOGOR review, we'll be also looking at not only how the 2010 economies have made um, major progress towards achieving BOGOR, but that the whole idea of BOGOR and what trade is has evolved and changed and frankly um, expanded. Um, I am confident that under Japan's leadership, um, we'll have a very, very good story to tell on BOGOR this year. Um, and I think that will ver bode very well, not only for their year, but for APEC more broadly. And um, I would just say that um, I think we'll need to give further thought this year as to whether BOGOR should still be the guiding principle um, for APEC going forward, or is it something we need to look at and see if, um, given how trade has changed, um, we need to come up with um, or at least update um, our guiding principle. Let me turn very quickly to planning um, for 2011. Um, for those of you who don't know, the United States um, is hosting APEC in 2011. Um, we're very, very excited about it. Um, I don't have any announcements to make because we're in a lot of meetings <laughs> and we're giving a lot of um, internal, let's just say there are a lot of internal deliberations on, um, on, on our preparations and on our agenda and in many ways, it's still a work in progress. 
Um, as part of our internal deliberations, we are grappling with a number of issues as we try and set our agenda for next year. And let me just highlight some of those issues. Um, and I think here I have five, five kind of questions that we're, we're focusing on. One, and this gets back to the back-to-back -back Japan US hosting, is how can we build on the accomplishments of the Japan year um, um, in the areas I mentioned, but in other areas as well? And so um, obviously we'll have to um, have a better sense of what we're, where we're gonna be in November um, in Japan and what the, the final accomplishments are for the Japan year. Um, but we are looking already at ways we can build on the work that is on um, our table in APEC. Second, um, it's no secret that APEC's um, work is spread over um, a wide group of committees and a very diverse agenda. Um, I've um, worked on APEC for about five years and I still go to meetings where I don't understand when they talk about certain groups and what work they're doing. I don't even understand which group it is because um, it's an alphabet soup and there's lots of people working on this. And so, um, and this is frankly an area where APEC has received some criticism that we, we do too much um, and we don't do it deep enough um, in too many areas. And so one of, the, one of the questions we're grappling with is that in our year, would it be useful to narrow the scope of what's addressed, particularly um, at the more senior levels, with the idea being if we concentrate on a smaller group of issues, perhaps we can have more meaningful and enduring outcomes. Third, um, and this gets to the point that APEC now is 20 years old, um, or actually this year it's 21, um, and frankly, it's, it's in a lot of ways, it's becoming kind of bureaucratic, um, and in a lot of ways, um, we're becoming complacent. And so we're looking at ways to kind of get out of this mode and see if there are fresh ways to think about our agenda, kind of out of the box thoughts about how we can not only structure our substantive year, um, but also um, look at the process related issues as well. And then I would just point to the question, and this is related to the last one, is if APEC's strength is really doing work on kind of the next set of issues that trade negotiators elsewhere are gonna to need to deal with, um, what are those next set of issues that we should be working on that APEC can really seize, do meaningful work on, and, and, and help shape the issue, and help lay some important groundwork? And we're doing that um, as well, trying to look ahead and finally, I would say for the United States, um, we are looking at how we can use our host year to help build support for our trade um, and investment um, agenda and how we can use our host year to educate people around the country about the importance of Asia Pacific, um, how important our ties are looking ahead um, and to um, make people realize there are lots of opportunities that are created by these um, ties. So I don't have answers to any of those, but I wanted to, to, to um, put them out there. And let me just conclude by saying that um, once again, we're very, very excited about 2011. Um, we're a little, um, as I say already, we're, it's April 2010. These months seem to go by too quickly in a way because we're getting closer and closer to 2011 and we have a lot of work to do, but we really believe a lot can be accomplished. And we look forward to working with our Japanese colleagues closely, our Australian colleagues and others, as well as many of you in the room um, to use this year and next in particular, and I'll, I'll just use once again, come back to what um, Vice President Mondale said, to really get APEC to regain um, its momentum. Thank you. Thanks very much, Wendy. <laughs> Wendy's reminded us of a couple of things that I think we should uh, take up uh, towards the end of this panel in discussion. Uh, and importantly, uh, that uh, if you're out there uh, doing business in the region now, uh, uh, the trade issues are often not the most important issues you have to deal with. The agenda ex still extends well beyond the trade issues, and as it does in APEC. Uh, and, and, and one thing to think about, I think, going forward uh, in managing this 
core set of APEC issues well beyond the trade liberalisation agenda is, is how to maintain a coherence of, uh, of focus, a continuity and the follow-on in those issues. Uh, in a way, Bogle provided that coherence on the trade liberalisation agenda in APEC's earlier years. Well, what do we have going forward from Tokyo uh, on this broader agenda that APEC now deals with? Uh, Jeff. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, I know time is, is tight, and so I will try to be concise. Uh, I hope you have all uh, uh, already enjoyed the key points of my presentation that Fred uh, gave you about a half an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, uh, Fred and I are, are, are doing a, a more uh, detailed study of uh, Asia-Pacific economic integration and prospects for uh, uh, a uh, pathways for the free trade area of the Asia-Pacific. And uh, uh, I think uh, uh, what you heard from Fred was a, a really expert uh, uh, overview of the types of issues that we're going to explore in much more detail, hopefully to inform uh, the uh, officials as they pursue their work over the next two years. Uh, what I would like to do uh, this morning, just very briefly, is, is put emphasis on, on uh, a key aspect of the APEC core agenda, and that is how to pursue regional economic integration. Uh, as has been clear from all of the discussions uh, this morning, APEC doesn't get together like, uh, uh, officials don't to get, get together in APEC like they do in Geneva in the WTO to negotiate a big bang a trade agreement. Uh, APEC's role is really in aligning national and regional policies and bringing them together uh, into a coherent uh, path towards uh, the desired ultimate objective of free trade and investment in the area, in the region. And there's been lots of activity. Uh, we've had NAFTA for 20 years. Uh, the ASEAN has been increasingly deepening its own internal integration. We, of course, have one of the high watermarks of economic integration arrangements, the uh, agreement between Australia and New Zealand. And more recently, uh, the what I would call partial scope agreements that the ASEAN countries have, have concluded with their uh, regional neighbors in Northeast Asia. Uh, on top of that, we now have the proposals from Japan for a uh, ASEAN plus six, bringing in both APEC and non-APEC members, uh, and uh, the evolving uh, talks on a Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now, what APEC can do uh, is essentially try to meld together these divergent initiatives into a coherent region-wide uh, free trade uh, uh, result. And uh, as Fred said, this will require uh, refocusing the Asia-only initiatives into an Asia-Pacific uh, uh, initiative. And so we're talking about essentially linking regionalism uh, that is already proceeding, which already includes hard <coughs> obligations. Uh, and for the APEC process, to do the facilitation in terms of the uh, preparations, the research, the background, uh, so that governments can pursue this type of melding. Uh, now, when we talk about the Bogor goals or free trade, a uh, uh, free trade area of the Asia Pacific, this is really a long run vision. This is not going to result in, uh, in uh, Yokohama or in Honolulu. Uh, it's a long-run process uh, that uh, has to inspire investment in the private sector if it is going to uh, really reach uh, its fruition uh, in the future. But it's important to note that we're not starting from scratch. We have all of these initiatives already underway, uh, and they are continuing to deepen among themselves, and they're continuing to expand their linkages with their neighboring groups both within Asia and within North America. Uh, and that has important implications for who participates in, uh, in, the, in the various uh, pathways to get to a broader uh, integration arrangement. 
Uh, and uh, so that's the challenge that, that we see the APEC members grappling with over the last few years is how to bring together these various arrangements, some already in force, some under construction among APEC members, that contain binding obligations, because uh, that's a key, key issue. Uh, voluntary uh, 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 commitments to liberalization uh, have had a place in the APEC history, uh, but they haven't had a very significant impact on uh, on the uh, evolution of uh, uh, economic policy in the region. Uh, and uh, so one has to, at the end of the day, as I know Wendy is, is, is trying to do, find a way to, to have an arrangement that produces the economic results and the policy predictability that comes from a, uh, a formal trade agreement. Uh, now, the existing arrangements that we have in the region are a mix, as Fred said, of gold standard and partial scope. Uh, all of them are replete with, it, with exceptions that inhibit economic integration. And that's going to be one of the challenges that is faced by government officials as they try to meld together these arrangements. Uh, because you're going to uh, have to think about trade-offs, how you deal with some of these sensitive issues that have in the individual, bilateral, or regional context been no-go areas, whether it's sugar in the U.S.-Australia uh, agreement or other types of issues that have hampered uh, integration arrangements in, uh, in, in Asia. Uh, there's going to need to be a thought about uh, hybrid approaches, uh, and Fred suggested that in his opening remarks to be able to move the, uh, the agreements uh, together. Uh, now, one of the important uh, areas is agriculture. Another important area will be labor. Uh, because of the sensitivity of uh, the importance of movement of labor in the region, uh, because of the uh, importance uh, uh, for uh, businesses in planning their trade and investment strategies. Uh, there will need to be a different way of approaching it, an APEC style, not a, not a uh, U.S. style or an Asian style, uh, if, a, if the APEC members are going to find a way of melding these arrangements together. And that will require uh, the experience and the creativity of our officials, uh, but uh, not only in terms of the substance, but also the process. And uh, as, as Fred suggested in his, in his remarks, it would make sense to uh, not allow the most intractable problems that have beset us for many years, that Wendy has solved a few, but has a few left over, uh, to allow that to stop the process at the start. So in agriculture, I think there's great merit in what Ambassador Nakamura has said in focusing on food security food safety, a big concern on both sides of the Pacific, uh, and one that there, where there can be some concrete deliverables uh, from uh, meetings this year and next year, uh, and can build a basis of trust for moving on to deal with other issues of uh, ag other agricultural problems that impede access. Uh, similarly, in labor, I think uh, there's some uh, uh, merit in looking again at visa issues and trying to expand the scope uh, selectively at first uh, of movement of, of, of people to encourage economic activity uh, and uh, looking more closely at the uh, principles of the International Labor Organization to find uh, a way of providing some, some guidance. All of this uh, 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 are substantive issues that the government officials will have to look into more, more carefully. Uh, but they will also need to look at the issue of who is at the table. And in my last two minutes, let me, let me uh, uh, talk about that. Right now, we're, uh, we're looking at a Trans-Pacific Partnership. I think the merit of the Trans-Pacific Partnership is that it is the one arrangement that has the opportunity for bringing in or bridging the various economic integration arrangements in the region. 
uh, because it can bring in participants from all of the different regions. Uh, and that is an advantage. The current P4 plus 4 doesn't necessarily do that. Uh, it doesn't provide a great deal of additionality. Uh, it is a good start, but uh, uh, as, as Fred noted, it, it would be important to expand shortly, uh, both in terms of uh, North America, where Canada uh, has uh, wanted to join for, for some time and has trade agreements with many of the participants, where Mexico already has bilateral agreements with many of the participants. It's also important uh, to have uh, the key countries in Northeast Asia, Japan, and Korea. And again, as Fred said, uh, that will, uh, uh, the Korean participation is, of course, uh, 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 critically depends on the passage of the Chorus FTA. Uh, adding an ASEAN member, as has been discussed, is, is, is important for linking a big ASEAN member to the uh, evolving Trans-Pacific Partnership team uh, as, as, a, as a channel for bringing the broader 10 into, into the club in the future. And there's one other country that people haven't thought about that's critical to the long-term success of this venture. Uh, and that is, at, at some point in the process, you're going to have to bring in China. And how do you prepare that road? Uh, China is not shown a great deal of interest in, in, in linking right now, uh, but it would make sense to invite Hong Kong to the table uh, as, as a way of providing a conduit of information and a way of providing some familiarity, some security of, of, of what's going on in the process so that you have a door open in the future for, for including a key component uh, to this process of regional economic integration. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Fred, as you can see, provides the questions and Jeff provides the answers. <laughs> but uh, actually, uh, you've co <laughs> come to the nub of the issue there. I think, the, uh, Jeff, uh, in thinking about uh, membership and how you take this thing forward, I mean, the critical question from the viewpoint of certainly this next two years, but maybe a much longer period of time, is what membership you encompass and what that does to the agenda of inclusiveness across the whole APEC uh, community, uh, and whether or not uh, you can affect an agreement uh, that actually uh, underpins or supports the APEC agenda without uh, uh, a totally inclusive uh, formal agreement, and if it's a totally, totally inclusive formal agreement, uh, then is that negotiable in any time soon, and, and why would you want to go there when there's so much more productive to do uh, on the agenda that uh, APEC's dealing with now? So uh, there are a set of questions that we'd like to come back to at the end, and uh, before we do that, let's uh, hear from Paul. Uh, thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you to the four uh, organisers of this roundtable and their distinguished uh, representatives here for giving us the opportunity to speak briefly uh, to the group. Um, the previous speakers have already gone through fairly comprehensively what the uh, APEC agenda is, so I might uh, limit myself to just highlighting the areas um, that uh, Australia attaches the most priority to. Uh, in doing that, it's probably going to be a little bit repetitive, but uh, I hope you'll take that as a positive sign that there's already been a bit of a meeting of the minds, at least between uh, Japan, Australia and ourselves, as to where the priorities lie for APEC uh, in this year and next. And indeed, beyond that, as a number of speakers have said, that. Uh, uh, we certainly are among those APEC members that favour having a, a multi-year program rather than reinventing uh, APEC's agenda every, every 12 months or so. Um, my, the starting point for my comments uh, is Australia's view that uh, when it comes to doing the assessment of the, of the Bogle goals, we think we'll be in a position to say that the developed economies have actually made very good progress towards meeting the Bogle goals. Um, uh, I, th I think I'd stop a little bit short of declaring absolute victory, but I think I would say that uh, the bulk of the work is done and certainly the bulk of the intellectual argument uh, about pr pursuing uh, free and open trade and investment uh, has essentially been won. Um, 
That said, there's still very much more to do, uh, and not least, as Wendy said before, because the agenda that's facing APEC economies is considered considerably different now and has involved a, a very great way uh, since the Bogle goals were first uh, set in 1994. So uh, in Australia's view, uh, we think it's time to start considering uh, a new core agenda for APEC, or at least an evolved core agenda for APEC, uh, which involves a, a long-term goal to drive progress throughout the whole of APEC economies and to drive regional integration beyond the BOGOR achievements. Uh, in our view, again, it would be timely for APEC economies to consider a new long-term focus on trade facilitation in particular and also on developing investment linkages. It would be our assessment that in the contemporary and future economic environments that we're facing, these are the areas that have the potential to deliver greater economic gains than further border liberalisation. To give you an example of a figure that was calculated, I think, by Apex Policy Support Unit, um, even modest improvements in Apex performance in areas like port logistics, standards harmonisation, administrative transparency and other areas related to trade facilitation could result in a further 10 per cent increase in intra-APEC exports worth roughly $280 billion a year. Um, just as significantly, and despite the good progress uh, already made under the BOGOR goals, the level of integration of APEC economies through investment linkages remains a little bit below potential uh, in our assessment, and that's an area that's required a new long-term focus. A long-term commitment by APEC to undertake structural reform behind the border will also be needed to ensure the gains of further integration are sustainable and distributed fairly among APEC countries and to help close <coughs> the gap between developing and developed countries. And this uh, comes to some of the issues that Ambassador Nakamura mentioned uh, in terms of the new growth paradigm. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning that APEC economies have already commenced work on, on an active agenda which moves beyond reducing barriers at the border to, injure, to addressing barriers to trade and investment behind the border, including through the activities it already has going, such as the Trade Facilitation Action Plans, which focus on improving customs procedures, business mobility, harmonisation of standards and conformance in, elect in electronic commerce, the Supply Chain Connectivity Framework, uh, which aims to improve regional supply chains connectivity by addressing uh, choke points that impede trade, uh, the Services Action Plan, uh, which again seeks to energise economies' identification of and action on barriers to services trade. The Investment Facilitation Action Plan, which aims to reduce the costs of uh, expanding business within the region. And the Closer Regional Coordination of Infrastructure Development, uh, just some examples. Uh, to our mind, uh, efforts in all these areas need to be intensified. Um, I'd also uh, mention briefly uh, the G20, which is a very important development that others have, have raised. Uh, in our view, to remain relevant, uh, APEC will need to contribute over the longer term to the G20 agenda, and in particular we think it can contribute to the G20 agenda aimed at rebalancing global economic growth through structural reform. There are many elements to the economic growth, and uh, as Ambassador Nakamura mentioned before, uh, APEC leaders in Singapore identified uh, the four areas of inclusive, environmentally sustainable, uh, knowledge-based growth and balanced growth. Uh, we would uh, assess that the key to achieving uh, the goals in growth in all of those areas is to ensure that our economies are able to reform their institutions and their markets. And uh, again, a, a key to a well-functioning market for goods, services, savings, investment and labour. Uh, are the key to promoting high quality growth uh, and that's the sort of growth that the leaders are, are seeking from us. The leaders agenda on uh, implementing structural reform will be particularly important in addressing those issues and we think it will be important to take that reform agenda forward uh, both in this year and in next year. Uh, developing a long-term comprehensive growth strategy should form a, an important part of Apex post bogle vision and it would position, if we could do that, APEC as a natural partner for the G20, uh, something we think, we think which should be very clearly on our minds. Um, uh, I'll leave my comments on the APEC agenda there. I just wanted to pick up a few things that would have been said about uh, TPP. 
Um, Australia is one of the eight uh, participants in the TPP exercise and uh, I'd like to think probably one of the most enthusiastic and, and active participants. Uh, we in fact uh, hosted the first uh, meeting of the TPP participants in Melbourne a few months back and are looking forward to the next meeting of the group which will be held in, in the US in uh, June I think. Um, uh, to pick up some of the questions that Professor Bergston put to us, in our view, the TPP should be as comprehensive and as ambitious as possible. Uh, we would also share the notion that TPP ultimately should be open to, to more members and, and the more of them and, and the larger, uh, the better. I think I might differ from him slightly if it comes to a trade-off between uh, the quality of the TPP and the timeliness of doing it. Uh, we approach the TPP as a, as a building block towards a broader um, framework for regional uh, uh, trade and investment to integration along the lines of a, of a, of a region-wide FTAP. And if we're going to approach it that way, again, I think uh, the, the higher the standard we set and, and, the, and the stronger the framework we start off with, um, uh, the better. I think the, uh, the agenda that we've outlined for APEC is perfectly consistent with uh, moving down that way. Uh, what we'd be looking for is a, a 21st century, a modern day, uh, free trade agreement. It's, it's possibly not even correct to, um, to characterise it as a free trade agreement. It's, a, it's more of, a, as, a, as the title suggests, an economic partnership than, uh, than just a free trade agreement. But we'd certainly see it as a very key, um, a key ambition for all of us. Um, I might, it, it's a, a little bit cheeky of me and uh, you'll forgive me for doing it uh, because it's a, a little <coughs> bit unfashionable these days to talk about the Doha round. Um, uh, but I think uh, if we're going to pursue growth strategies, as I think we should, which don't confine uh, integration to Asia or even to the Asia-Pacific, but hopefully spread integration globally, then we shouldn't put all of our eggs in the TPP basket. Uh, there's some significant work to do out there to conclude the, uh, the Doha round. Our G20 leaders have implored us to do it uh, in this uh, very town and on the first uh, meeting of the G20 leaders, then in London and then most recently in Pittsburgh. And I think we should take their, um, uh, their plea to us uh, seriously and move ahead with as ambitious uh, an outcome as we can to the Doha round as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. We've got uh, time for one or two questions from the floor, uh, but uh, I want to just come back and pose the panel with uh, a question about uh, the emphasis on the multi-year program and the importance of that to the continuity and follow-up through APEC uh, and how you might shape that, uh, how you might label it, uh, and uh, how you might distinguish it from uh, the Bog or Goals agenda or relate it to the Bog or Goals agenda. So uh, this is the kind of a moment to think about the change and uh, we would like to pursue the kind of a new visions. Thank you. Uh, Wendy, what we've heard talked about here in terms of the breadth and scope of the APEC agenda already, uh, if not uh, the labelling of the APEC agenda already, is really the ambition for uh, uh, a single market for, uh, for sustainable growth in the region. Uh, which engages all parts of the region. Uh, do you think that's uh, uh, a possibility uh, as uh, a way forward in giving a forward program for APEC uh, the coherence it needs? Hmm. I mean, I, I agree with what Ambassador Nakamura said, and that is something that, given it is 2010 and we are now assessing Bogor, this is a logical time to take a step back and to see if that guiding principle, that underlying principle, um, is still relevant. I think one area where I, I, I maybe differ a bit with some of the other speakers is that when I talk about trade, I don't talk about just traditional trade issues. And in fact, what I spend a lot of my time on at USTR is working on what are labeled here as behind the border issues. So somehow this distinction that behind the border issues are in trade issues and therefore we need to do a single market or at least look at that as, as, as one objective is not something I personally um, you know, view the world like that. But um, that said, um, once again, I think we need to give thought to a new vision, but I also think we need to give thought to APEC and to make sure that what we, any new vision 
or any twist on our current vision that we announce that we're credible um, and that what we announce is very understandable to the public and not viewed as something that um, APEC failed at this, APEC failed at that, so therefore let's just come up with something new. I think we need to be very thoughtful, very mindful um, to what we've achieved so far and how we can build on those achievements. Uh, Jeff, uh, as you said, some things uh, are negotiable, some things uh, aren't uh, readily negotiable within current frameworks. Uh, uh, w would you see a distinction between the negotiable uh, things uh, uh, that can be dealt with in a formal framework uh, uh, as uh, essentially different from those things which APEC can deal with outside that sort of framework, or do you see your melding concept of en as encompassing both? Mm. <clears throat> well, I think the melding proce uh, uh, process is a way of dealing with some of the political constraints. And what I was suggesting in terms of the sequencing of, of, of the initiatives was uh, avoid uh, a, a issues that are relatively small in economic terms, but relatively big in terms of potential political blockers from getting in the way of the broader progress that is needed. And, and in this case, we're talking about a region that has experienced incredible uh, uh, advances in globalization in the past 20 years, under the APEC 20 years. And so the vision, I don't think, has to be recast. Uh, if if uh, countries had understood how much globalization would have advanced in the next 20 years, they, they would have taken a lot more actions to move towards meeting the Bogor goals well ahead of time. Uh, and so I think there's an incentive uh, that every businessman has in the region in terms of planning trade and investment strategies uh, to move in that direction. And it's a question of how do the governments deal with some of the political obstacles that get in the way of uh, both at the border and behind the border uh, in ensuring that we get the maximum bang for the buck uh, in our economies and create the maximum amount of jobs. It might be said that some of the barriers that are most persistent and difficult, the agricultural barriers and the sensitive areas and so on, uh, are now really relatively irrelevant to, to, to the integration agenda in, in, in APEC, uh, which has been concentrated in a whole new area, the area uh, that Wendy worries about in terms of uh, facilitating the development of effective supply chains and the integration of production and trade within uh, the trans-Pacific economy. Uh, Paul, uh, how, how do you marry uh, that with uh, redefining APEC's goals down the track? You were the multi-track person, a multi-year program the person. Multi -year person. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, look, I, 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 Wendy's right, of course. Um, uh, they are all trade, uh, and uh, we're not meaning to make a false distinction uh, uh, between uh, the conventional uh, border measures and the, and the measures behind the border. I guess one of the reasons why it becomes an issue, at least to, within uh, government circles in my country, is that um, uh, those sorts of issues, whether, whether it's uh, competition policy, customs procedures, those sorts of things, are not normally the responsibility of trade portfolios within government. Uh, and I, I'm sorry to be a bureaucrat here for a moment, but unfortunately that's the reality that we deal with here. Um, and I think we've got to bear that in mind uh, when we take the APEC agenda forward and indeed the agenda of other trade negotiations as well, um, that we're involving now more different parts of governments, more portfolios, more ministries in the same endeavour towards the same objective, um, but some of them coming from slightly different philosophies uh, is a, the politest way I can put it. Um, and that's a challenge for us. Uh, in fact, I uh, was talking before I came to Washington to a good friend of mine who uh, was one of the key negotiators of the Australia-US free trade agreement. And uh, I, I in fact said to him, I said, is there anybody in, in Washington you want me to catch up with that you spent a lot of time negotiating the FTA with? He said, look, the truth of the matter is that I spent 95% of my time on the US FTA negotiating with other Australians. We have time for one quick question from the floor if uh, anybody would like to seize the moment. Anyone like to? Please? Okay, then uh, I think we'll wrap this panel up uh, and take 15 minutes for coffee and a break. <laughs>